it's June 2022 and NZXT or NZXT if you must, has launched a pair of Z690 motherboards that support Intel 12th gen Alder Lake processors. We're going to handle these in two separate reviews, so let's start with the N5 Z690. Priced at £210 here in the UK, $240 in the USA and globally, it's relatively basic. You can see that the NZXT styling covers the chipset and the VRMs. The rest of the board is left to its own devices. Having said that, it's not without its points of interest. So let's dive into a full review. The accessories for the N5Z690, very basic. SATA cables, various M.2 screws, and a couple of Wi-Fi antennae. The layout, also very straightforward. We've got support for DDR4 memory, which is a significant cost saving with this motherboard, and also with the N7Z690, that's also DDR4. We have a single M.2 heatsink at the top, held in place with screws, nothing fancy or clever. Revealing the top primary M.2, and we have one, two, three M.2s there, and a fourth M.2 on the back of the board, which is what you expect on an ITX design. Very strange that, do not begin to understand why. There's nothing else on the back of the board, just that M.2. PCI Express expansion, we have three times 16 mechanical slots, but they do not operate that way. The main slot for graphics is Gen 5 by 16. This secondary slot is Gen 4 by 4. That is a Gen 3 by 1. You've also got a couple of other times ones. Let us take off the heat sinks on the VRMs. Four screws, dead straightforward. Comes off in one piece. It's two heat sinks that are held together that screw there. Reasonable amount of uh, mass to it, reasonable amount of area. And we have some very basic Dr. Moss VRMs. Eight plus one configuration for the eight for the V Core, one for the IGP. Rich tech controller, and they are 50 amp Dr. Mosses. By the look of it, this is an ASRock Phantom Gaming 4 board. So you're paying something like 25, 30 pounds premium for the NZXT heatsink and their chipset cooler and also for the cam software support which you will see when the board is up and running. And on the rear I.O. we have a relatively basic panel. We have two antenna points for the Wi-Fi 6E, an HDMI output, which obviously is relevant if you're using the Intel integrated graphics, a pair of USB 2.0s, a button for BIOS flashback, one USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C, one USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-A, two and a half gigabit Realtek Ethernet, and four USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A, and triple audio jacks. And I have to say, seeing three audio jacks on a modern motherboard is quite a throwback for me. Everything these days surely has five jacks and SPDIF, but there we go. The layout of the M5 is perfectly tidy, but of course there isn't a great deal of hardware for ASRock Stroke NZXT to accommodate. At the top of the board, we've got an 8 plus 4 EPS. Running across here, we have three fan headers, two RGB connectors for NZXT hardware, USB 3 type A, USB 3 type C, obviously two ports and one port respectively. Another laid down USB 3 type A, so we've now got up to four uh, USB 3.2 3 Gen 1, USB 3.0. We've got four laid down SATA. At the foot of the board, we have two more fan headers. We have a single USB 2.0 header supporting two ports or uh, devices such as NZXT's own cam type devices. Two RGB connections, 112 volt, 15 volt. So that might be a touch awkward uh, there are many times you want to connect your RGB at the top of the board. Clearly NZXT wants you to use their own connector. And finally we have the audio header. 
Let's install a little bit of hardware. So we've got uh, a Sabrent Rocket M.2 SSD, which goes in the primary slot. That's straightforward. There isn't a securing screw for that because it's held in place by the heatsink. You will note covers that screw hole there. So it follows, you need to install your motherboard in the case, then install the M.2, then put the heatsink on, then screw it down. It makes you think that perhaps the smarter move is to install your SSD in one of these two slots, forget the back slot, but of course then you need a heat sink. So uh, a bare M.2 without its own heat sink, it's going under there, fiddly. Processor. Core i9-12900K. Bit of overkill on this motherboard quite frankly. And some Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 3600. Our test system sits on a Streacom open test bench powered by a Seasonic Prime Titanium 850 watt power supply. CPU cooler is this Corsair H150i Elite LCD. And we have a Palette RTX 3080 Gaming Pro graphics card. Two points to note, the Corsair cooler requires two internal USB 2 headers, one for the screen, one to connect up and control this RGB fan hub. Uh, happily, they supply a Y cable in the box, which means you can connect both of these headers to the single internal USB 2 header on the motherboard. The other thing is I've connected the fans directly to the motherboard as is my want, uh, which means I can see exactly what speed the fans are running at at all times. Here we are in the BIOS on the easy mode screen, which means there's not a lot going on apart from information about the memory processor, SSD and such like, i.e. you don't really change a lot in here. One thing worth noting is XMP is currently set to profile one, which is the equivalent of on. The alternative is to put it to auto, which actually means off. So let's leave it on. Down in tools, we have the ability if we want to update the BIOS. Let us go over to advanced mode, which is slightly more interesting. So basic information, overclocking, CPU configuration, everything is currently on auto, but we do have the ability to tinker with settings if we choose. I suspect most customers for this motherboard won't even see this screen, they'll re remain in easy mode. Going into voltage configuration, everything on auto, again, as you'd expect. What options do we have if we choose to change load line calibration? Ah, the good old ASRock chart. So it shows we've actually got level one up high, five droops significantly, and level four is the default, which is fine on auto. Fiverr configuration, this is the voltage regulator within the CPU that controls the power to the different parts of the CPU. Everything on auto, just as you'd expect. Adaptive, or we can change to override, which means that we're taking control. We'll leave all that well alone. What do we have in the way of tools? SSD arrays, uh, also SSD. We can update the BIOS, and that is it. PC monitoring. everything on auto. However, here we are in Windows and we have three control utilities running. We have Synapse for our razor, mouse and keyboard, Corsair IQ for the uh, CPU cooler, and then we have NZXT Cam basically doing the system. So you can see there's a good degree of overlap. The Cam interface, huh, that's ironic. Uh, so the communication has been lost. Let's go back 
let's actually shut that down, do it again. Right, to see what we're doing in cooling, we have to actually scroll up and down because we can't expand the window. However, we do, oh good grief. Okay, let's restart the PC and get some testing underway. The fan curves are set to a custom mode, so they start low, and as soon as the temperature starts to rise and the CPU ramps up to 100%. Let us see what happens when we run Cinebench R23. We've got PL1 set to 180 watts and PL2 to 241 watts. Fans ramp up exactly as we expect. CPU speed is a nominal 4.9 gigahertz all cores, 4.88. So even though the power limit allowed the CPU to draw more power, it did not. So let's call this a nominal 4.9 on the P cores, nominal 3.7 on the E cores. Okay, we're now into the PL1 figure and we do indeed see 180 watts for the CPU package, so the turbo period has ended. Right, settling down now, 4.6 all core on the P cores, 3.7 on the E cores, and that is 180 watts. A couple of points about the various test runs I've made. There's no particular need to run NZXT's CAM software as it doesn't control any functions on the motherboard and clearly the cooling in this instance is handled by Corsair IQ. So it's yet another monitoring utility and as we know they tend to clash. So the fact that CAM crashed repeatedly on this motherboard is not quite indicative that CAM is a piece of junk uh, but software doesn't tend to play nicely with other software, that's just a fact. In this instance you don't need to use CAM with this motherboard uh, with this configuration and uh, I would have been better off not using it. The other thing is the VRM temperatures are not monitored by either HWinfo or indeed CAM itself. Uh, I stuck some thermocouples on the VRMs but this is obviously an open test bench so it's not exactly the same as a regular PC build. The VRMs are nice and cool, low 50s, 52 degrees as it happens during repeated runs of Cinebench. So VRM temperatures, not an issue, but as you saw, the CPU wasn't exactly working very hard, but it did a reasonable job. Onward to our test results. In Cinebench R23 Multicore, the N5 did a perfectly reasonable job supporting the CPU at 4.9 gigahertz. In single core, the NZXT and its N7 brother shot to the top of the charts, albeit by a small margin. However, look at that, 5.2 gigahertz on single core. Well done, NZXT. Blender Classroom is much like R23 multi-core, so the N5 is down in the middle of the chart. Bapco Crossmark, the Intel-friendly test, the N5 and the N7 pretty much tie. They're doing nicely. 3D Mark Time Spy, just the CPU test. The two NZXT motherboards are right down the bottom of the Core i9-12900K figures. The CPUs below that are lesser processors. ADA64 memory bandwidth, NZXT at the bottom of the chart, but of course we're comparing DDR4 against DDR5, and that just is not a fair fight. Onward to gaming, Far Cry 6. The N7 is at the top of the chart, a frame or two ahead of the M5. Now obviously we don't test all these games and all these motherboards simultaneously and we know games get updated over time as do graphics drivers. But taking all that together, NZXT has done a good job. Far Cry New Dawn, same story, NZXT doing well, N5 doing best of all. Watch Dogs Legion, the spread of frame rates here is very, very small. NZXT, however, wins. CPU temperature in Blender Classroom. The N5 is lovely and cool. Admittedly, the CPU is not working very hard and we have strapped on a 360mm AIO, so we're playing to its strengths. But you can't take away the fact this CPU is icy cool. Power consumption in Cinebench R23, so the graphics are basically idling. System power, 285 watts. The N5 is barely sipping on the wall socket. In conclusion, what do I think of the NZXT N5Z690? Pros, the good points. Smart styling, particularly if you have an NZXT case. 
It has good support for M.2 storage. I'm ignoring the M.2 on the back of the board because that just seems a bit weird to me. But the three slots on a budget motherboard, yep, that works for me. DDR4 support helps you save money. Clearly there's a performance offset, but DDR4's been around for years. You can buy the memory quite cheap. DDR5, nah, not so much. And performance is decent. Performance is actually better than I expected. On auto, clearly we're not getting the potential of the i9 here. And in fact, I'd recommend you don't use this board with a Core i9. If you're going to spend that money on that processor, you should probably step up on the motherboard. This is more suited to an i7 or even an i5. Cons. The negative points. Cam software can be flaky, as you saw. Having said that, in this instance, I'm not sure I'd even bother installing it. The VRMs will not appeal to overclockers. In actual fact, I'd say if you're an overclocker, don't touch this motherboard or similar motherboards. Uh, you should go elsewhere. But then if you go back to my reviews of the Core i9, Core i7, Core i5, you will note that the i9, I'd say don't bother overclocking it at all. Core i5, different story. If you're going to overclock your Core i5, I do not think this is the motherboard for you. This is a niche point, but the ARGB headers, we have two NZXT headers up there and we have two conventional headers down the foot of the board. I think it'd be good to have another five volt ARGB header up at the top of the board, just for convenience. And finally, it'd be useful to have another USB 2 internal header. Then again, perhaps that's more of a reviewer's thing. Perhaps the general market doesn't much care about internal USB 2 headers in this day and age. So minor points. Overall, I think this is a board you should consider, and that might surprise you. I did not come into this review with any great expectations for the N5, and it's done okay.